This is World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with your host, Carl Gruber. World Awakenings is a podcast dedicated to opening your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to all things spiritual, metaphysical, and enlightening, and just how they play an all-important role in our daily life. So join Carl on this enlightening experience as he interviews metaphysical and spiritual experts to discuss, debate, and delve deeply into the hows and whys of this worldwide awakening. Hey everyone, I'm excited to welcome you back to the show World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment. The show that takes a deep dive into all things spiritual, metaphysical, and enlightening. As usual, I've got another incredible guest lined up to surprise and delight you, so hang on to your seat. Now, before we meet our guest, I'd like you to check out my new ebook, The Jogger to Runner Book, which you can now get a copy of for only $1.99. I may be a law of attraction and spiritual life coach, but I have also run 78 full marathons and coach my local running club, so I'm a proponent of helping others enhance their health and well-being and to get people out running for a lifetime. Just click the link below in the show notes to get your ebook today. The copy of the Jogger to Runner book for only $1.99. As I love to say, gotta run. So let's check in with our uh, guest today, Phil Webster. Phil is an author, actor, and developing medium. After living abroad and traveling the world for 20 years, he returned to his native England in 2017 and embarked on an acting career. Most notably, he has worked with people such as Ellie Fanning, Sylvester Stallone, Tom Hardy, and Benedict Cumberbatch. I love that name, Cumberbatch to name a few. At the tail end of the uh, pandemic, an unexplained event coupled with devastating loss sent him down a completely different path forever. We're going to go in depth on that. These uh, events prompted a life review and exploration into the mystical, which culminated in his Amazon Top of the Charts book, Blood and Glow, which I've been reading. It's really interesting. And it's soon to be released sequel, Glowing Deeper. So let's check in right now with uh, Phil Webster. Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to be here on World Awakenings. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, like I was uh, mentioning, and you and I were talking a little bit before we we, uh, started the show, um, yeah, you've got a lot to talk about. Man, it sounds like just in the last few months, you've spent several weeks in the deserts of Iraq working on a movie. And then after that, you went to far northern Finland in the icy, cold snow in dark conditions. That's quite two different places on Earth. How did all that come about? The the Iraq thing was well. I, well, I used to live in Finland. I, I lived in I lived there for a long time. Um, uh, it, it was a good place to. It was a good base to sort of travel to other places from. Um, money's good there. Like work was consistent um, with what I was doing at the time, and and it was a comfortable way of living. The Iraq thing was completely out of the blue um it's got like a little bit a weird slight mystical aspect to it at least i I think it does i i sat in meditation i've been hearing a lot about people talking about uh shifting timelines and stuff like that right Mm -hmm. but i'll give this a go so i sat and had a meditation did a quick meditation and i was you know sort of visualizing money (laughs) and books flying off shelves stuff like that and maybe an acting job here and there um (laughs) And and uh, no sooner than 10 minutes had I finished the meditation, uh, a guy called me who I met at a party in 2017, right? I haven't heard a word from this guy. Um, and he was a director. And and back then, I'd, I'd just moved back to the UK and I'd gone to drama school to just sort of somehow get involved in the movie industry. I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, I just thought that was the easiest way to sort of get involved. And and he remembered me from back then and pretty much like offered me the lead role in a TV show that was shooting in Kurdistan, Mm. and and at the time like i say money was kind of one one sort of uh day job had just kind of finished and and that was kind of my main concern and i was like sure i'll, I'll do it you know um i didn't really know what where he was talking about to be honest in like in complete honesty and um a, a week later i was in kurdistan iraq um yeah shooting this tv show um which is only going to be shown over there so um yeah fame fame in kurdistan <laughs> never saw never saw that coming <laughs> Wow. So 
so being uh, an Englander in Iraq, where did you feel safe? I know they're not always welcoming to uh, Westerners. Yeah, well, I gotta say, you know, um, like I say, ignorant, ignorantly, I didn't sort of um, really do my research until I, I knew I was going there. So, you know, um, Kurdistan sort of try to remain independent, even though they are part of uh, Iraq. But because of that, they have like a lot of a lot of um, a lot of countries around them don't particularly like them. Um, uh, hopefully, I won't get in upset anyone, anyone with saying this. Um, but yeah, they they seem like you know they're sort of trying to do this balancing act of of trying to be independent without actually being able to be independent. Um, so I kind of did my research on the place, and when I got there, the first couple of weeks of filming was it, it was somewhat challenging, like the the whole different environment and and things like that. Um, it's it's not a place that I would have probably gone to just you know off off through my own sort of interest um but people were very welcoming and then around the time that everything started kicking off around the uh, with what's going on now in the middle east even though it's pretty far away from there um uh, at least at the beginning of it i i definitely noticed a little bit of a change in attitudes just on the street you know um walking into a shop and i i, I don't know if i was just i i think i really did perceive it you know that I wasn't just kind of um you know uh, imagining it um and then a couple of people did say to me um that I was working with they said this might be time to go you know uh, having a couple of a couple of uh, a friend of mine he was probably I'd say mid 60s he said you know these things can escalate really really quickly and you wouldn't want to be here you know um so we wrapped up filming pretty much the same time that he said that and I did come back a week earlier than, than was planned. Um, the American air base next to the airport where I would have flew out of kept getting targeted by drones. Um, nobody was actually, nobody was, you know, really badly injured, but um, it seemed like it was escalating. Nothing's actually happened there since I left, but yeah, I was, you know, I was kind of happy to be back in dreary London. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what's the name of this movie uh, that you were filming in Iraq? Is it going to come out soon or is it out already? Yeah, it was. Oh God, I'm going to be really ignorant now. And and so it had a, it had a Kurdish name. Um, it's going to be a Kurdish TV show. Um, so oh. they probably, won't, probably won't see the light of day over here. But it was based on a book written by an English soldier that was stationed there in World War II. And he spent five years there. And there was kind of at the... It was a real turning point for them. Like England was still trying to pretend that they were running the show um and and that was kind of on its way out and he was kind of like the last of that sort of generation and he just sort of documented his time there and and i played him and i think that the the actual show itself will go beyond this character although he seemed to be the main focal point of that that season um yeah they're doing a season two already and i'm, I'm not going back for that so yeah the character was out of there by then anyway Awesome. So uh, I admire you for being acting. I have like zero <laughs> talent in that area. But yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, your book, uh, Letting Glow, recounts your story uh, of uh, you, your early years in your life and and uh, the slow awakening and all the amazing uh, mystical and metaphysical experiences you you had. And, and the interesting thing, too, that I read, I mean, some of your early earlier adult years you pretty much much lived a life almost like a jet setter doing going all over the world miami beach and all that stuff yeah i i just kind of i so i grew up on this place called the isle of Wight, which is a, an island at the south of england um a very rural place um pretty much the most interesting things that happened there i think was 60s early 70s hendrix played there uh the right. doors played there uh, yeah. And that was pretty, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, they, they've recently sort of started that festival up again. So it's kind of, it's kind of, a, you know, pe people do go there for the summer. It's like a seasonal place. Um, but yeah, as a kid, I couldn't wait to get out of there. You know, I felt very constricted there. Um, so as soon as I sort of hit early 20s, I, I, I was just desperate to, um, to get that out and about, you know. Um, but yeah, strangely enough, I just kind of, ended up making Helsinki and Finland my base um, and then saw a lot of places from there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I was going to say, boy, you should write a book. You already have. So <laughs> that's great. Well, you know, so uh, looking at your book, reading your book, you had so many different um, experiences that 
it, it would seem they almost snuck up on you. You you had a experience. Of, I think I read you were you wrote about this in Letting Glow. You recount, recount when you were a teenager, you heard the band Queensryche singing about lucid dreaming, and that kind of opened up your curiosity about the metaphysical things, right? That's true. Yeah. Um, so I'd always kind of I'd always been into sort of spooky stuff, like I, as a as a sort of um only child I, I i you know i would get immersed in so i suppose we all do as kids um you know immersed in sort of like fantasy stuff like movies anything i was kind of obsessed with these things um but yeah i i, I did i heard a song by yeah queen's right um called silent lucidity and the, and i sort of I, I read a magazine that with an interview and they were talking about this thing called lucid dreaming um and and some sometimes soon afterwards i found myself in a, in a little esoteric bookshop on the Isle of Wight. So this was like early to mid nineties um, in the UK. I mean, people talked about this stuff, but it wasn't as commonplace as it probably was in some places in the States or, or as it is now. Um, and I found this little book on, on, you know, and it had a chapter on lucid dreaming. I couldn't afford to buy it at the time. So I just tried to read as much as I could in the shop. And, um, and then I got to a part on astral projection and I was like, okay, well, what's that, you know, and, and read about this and, and, as I was probably like 14, 15 or something like that, I was like, well, that sounds pretty cool. You know, you get to fly out, fly out of your body around the neighborhood or whatever. And um, and I just kind of saw it like that. And and I went home that night and, and that's all I, all I knew on it. You know, this was pre-internet uh, or, you know, as, as far as it was available to us in, in those days. Um, and I just concentrated really hard on getting up off the bed, just laying on my bed and... um you know, without actually getting up. And I, I don't know how long I did this for, but all of a sudden something shifted and I, and I felt myself, you know, rise up. So I was laying on the bed with my eyes closed. And then I suddenly had this kind of sensation of being above the bed uh, or, you know, above myself. But then the thing that really threw me off, which I, which I wasn't anticipating was I had a third perspective from the side of the room. And mm. that, that was like, you know, blew my mind at, 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 at that age, you know, I was like, well, okay, what the heck's this, you know? Um, so I was watching this whole thing take place from a third point of view. Like I could see myself on the bed, could see myself above the bed. And, and then I was, you know, feeling these sensations as well. And it was just too much, you know? So I just kind of snapped myself out of it and I thought, okay, yeah, I'm done with that, you know? And, and, and interestingly, I sort of, every time I would just try to go to sleep that night, um, I just, kept feeling this separation just kept happening again and again um until eventually at some point i guess i just fell asleep and i remember going to school the next day telling a friend about it and he's like yeah okay cool <laughs> and i was like yeah i don't know did it really happen or, or what but anyway just to just to get wrap that story up um a couple of years later i was watching a, a morning tv show and um and somebody called in to speak to a psychic and he described this exact same thing. And, and it was the first time that I'd heard somebody talk about this third perspective. You know, he described it as being stuck to the wall, watching himself float off from his bed. And I was like, well, that was, you know, that's that's what happened to me, you know. And that that was kind of the only validation I, I'd ever heard of it. And I haven't really heard that description of it since. A, a couple of people have emailed me uh, since reading the book. Um, but, I, I, yeah, it doesn't seem to be that common, the the, the third perspective thing. Well, and you know, you, you write about that uh, incident uh, very, very nicely in your book, you know, being a teenager too. So just out of curiosity, the, you, you had three perspectives, your body asleep in the bed, the uh, part of you that floated out of the body, but then this third perspective. What do you think that third perspective was? Was it the real you? Is are all three of you of the, those perspectives the real you? I wonder. You know, um, I, I just just to sort of clarify, I, I was conscious. Uh, I was awake on the bed. Um, I, I hadn't fell asleep. Um, but it's interesting. I was listening to somebody talk today, um, a, 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 an author and teacher of mine. A medium called Claire Broad and she was describing and I always kind of get these mixed up a bit when people talk about the spirit and soul I'm like well what's the difference you know and she was talking about um soul being pure consciousness and spirit being the you know the the ethereal body um uh, like sort of I suppose our our identity as a as a spirit if, if you were to believe in these things um and then of course the body you know the as we sort of move about so 
I don't know, a third perspective? Could it be sort of pure consciousness? Like a, um, maybe that, you know, that, that's, that's a really bad explanation. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the only way I can sort of fathom it, that, that it's like something beyond beyond the spirit, beyond the body, but that, that you know, that awareness over everything, you know. Yeah, that, that that's kind of what probably would make most sense to me. I like uh, I like Claire's description. So the the soul is your pure consciousness, and then yeah, the... I, I believe she meant like soul consciousness. You know, like the con connect that that's connected to source, uh, what whatever you'd want to call it. Um, that would then individualize itself as a spirit, which would be us with the identity, and then that spirit would come into this uh, physical incarnation. <laughs> we've gone, yeah. we've covered a lot already. We've gone from Iraq to a. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I like to ask a quick question. <laughs> um, well, I also read, too, that you uh, you had a big shift in your life and consciousness when you were 39 years old. What happened at that time? Yeah, so, you know, I'd, I'd had these things would happen as a kid. Um, I would say that there was, like, instances of, of, of paranormal activity around the house when, when, I was a, when I was a teenager and things like that. But as I got older, I just kind of, put it behind me you know and sort of doubted it you know like the astral projection thing I was like did that really happen I wasn't sure I mean I've got this clarification from the tv show but still uh, I've always found that these memories if we have like a if you would call it a mystical experience they don't necessarily sit in your memory the same way as practical things do you know it seems to come in from a different angle somehow um you know we don't touch it we don't taste it we don't you know it's more like a feeling of, of whatever it is um, but yes, I sort of, as I hit my thirties, I was living abroad. I was, uh, at the time I was running bars and clubs and I kind of developed this very cynical sort of outlook on life. I was living a pretty, um, egocentric life. I would say, um, I was just kind of partying a lot and, you know, just concentrating on what I thought was, or what I perceived as fun, you know? Um, and I remember waking up one morning and I wasn't hung over or anything like that, but I just had this thought and I was just thinking about, how you know we've only got the moment of now essentially you know like uh you know we measure things with with linear time like there's there's that behind us this this sort of memory of events that we've got or you know shared events like a, as a sort of universal memory or, or whatever you would call it and then there's an idea about the future you know but essentially all we've got is this moment of now and of course i'm not the first person to talk about this you know and i'd read about this before and never really gone too deeply into it but this particular morning it was as though something switched and linear time just seemed absurd. Um, and, and it's as though it fell away and I was suddenly kind of, not to use the astral projection kind of analogy, but I was kind of over here observing my own thoughts. It, it was it was overwhelming and, and it was terrifying. It was suddenly, it was suddenly now, 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 all the time. I couldn't switch it off. You know, it was like people talk about being in the moment of now and being, you know, ultra aware of, the here and now it was like that times a thousand and i, and I kind of can't stress how it, it was terrifying it sort of sent me into a full-blown panic attack and i thought all right well i'll walk this off and and i tried to walk it off and i couldn't it, all of a sudden everything seemed really absurd you know i was kind of looking down the road and thinking well i'm going to be over there in a moment but where is that moment now and, and, I, and it just kind of sounds like stoner talk or something but it was it was very profound, you know, beyond profound. Um, and I, and I thought, well, this will wear off, you know, I can't continue like this, but it just didn't stop. And I, I went to work and, and I tried to sort of get on with things. And I tried to explain to people what I was going through and people were looking at me like, okay, is he, is he like cracked, you know? And, and, and I started feeling like I had, um, and I gave it a couple of weeks. This thing just didn't stop. Like I would wake up in the morning now, now, now I couldn't sort of just drift off and think, what I was going to eat in the for lunch or what I did yesterday. It was just like this new awareness, you know, um, like a spotlight was being shone on me. And it was just, I just didn't know what the heck was going on. I went to a doctor and tried to explain all this. And, and, you know, unsurprisingly, she, she started using words like psychosis, which terrified me, you know, um, and she gave me some sleeping pills, anti-anxiety meds, didn't touch it. Okay. The sleeping pills would knock me out. But the whole thing would start up again the next day. I went to another doctor a couple of weeks later. And not to take this down a dark path, but I, I say probably like a month into this, I did start thinking about 
well, this my brain's broken. You know, this doesn't work for me. I, I wasn't thinking anything spiritual around this. I was thinking schizophrenia. I I, I don't know. Um, and I started thinking, well, if this is the way that this is going to work, then I'm I'm probably going to check out of here. You know, and I've never had that thought before. Um, I didn't say this to the doctor, but anyway, the the next doctor, same diagnosis, uh, psychosis which has terrified me. Um, so I continued a while longer and somewhere over the next couple of months. And again, this just didn't let up. It was 24 uh, seven. I found a psychiatrist and I was like, okay, well I'll go see this guy. And what attracted me to him was that he was a hypnotist. So I was like, okay, just zap this away. I, I'm done, you know, just make this go away. I want to be back to the herd and, and thinking about what I'm, you know, whatever my daily concerns. And he was like, no, 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 man. He was like, you're fine. This is, you're not losing it. He was like, this is an, an awakening, you know? And, and I was like, okay, well, whatever, you know, could just please just, you know, help. Um, and he started using words like mysticism and talking about primordial time and shamanism and, and all these things that I didn't care anything about at the time, you know? Um, and he, and he was talking to me as though I was having some, you know, he used the word mystic. He said, I believe you are mystic. And I felt okay well again felt kind of uncomfortable about it i didn't really mean anything to me um and he essentially after a couple of sessions he gave me a very powerful but basic grounding meditation um that just worked amazingly you know um so after a few months of just thinking i was going out of my mind this one meditation brought me straight back um briefly and then it all started up again but i would practice this meditation every day very gradually over over a period of about a year i kind of slowly came back you know online i would have like two good days and then it would be three good days and four good days and eventually whatever was going on sort of faded out and um yeah sort of you know re rejoined rejoined the herd i guess but yeah it was it was terrifying um and and just you know i would never dismiss a mental illness but it did leave me wondering like you know, like a, it, like medication didn't touch it, but meditation sort of brought me back, you know, and looking at it from a different perspective. So I wonder, you know, and, and not to, again, not in any way to pretend that people don't have real mental health issues. Um, if this does go unnoticed, you know, here and there. What I read in your book, I think you're talking about your, I believe, a Finnish friend named Jua. And he said to you, right now, you fear that you are losing your grip on reality when in truth is you're actually seeing reality. So which put you in the now. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, your reaction to being in the now, you thought you were going crazy. Uh, and mm. then somebody like Eckhart Tolle to him, it was just pure bliss, and he's never come out of it, and he stays right there. Yeah, yeah, that is that is an interesting take. And I, you know, I've never actually read his book. Um, actually, the the psychiatrist suggested that he was like that. That's one of the first books you should read. And I remember, yeah. I, I just couldn't concentrate on on anything at the time, and I never did finish it. Um, but yeah, it does seem like we had a sort of parallel experiences. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was definitely what was you know going on, but. Um, it wasn't fun, not not at all. Yeah, yeah not, when you're but, trying, not when you're trying to live that 3D life you know, working in a bar. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah, that's it. You know, and I just wanted to get back to that. Um, and But, you know, I did come away from it very changed. You know, I, I feel like my ego got smashed to pieces. You know, um, it, it made me reevaluate everything. And pretty soon after that, I, I decided to come home, you know, uh, back to the UK and sort of take a completely different direction. Went to drama school, tried to look into this acting thing. Um, yeah, you know, and, and it seemed for a while everything was kind of on the right track. And then of course, COVID happened. And and then around the same time, my my mom passed away. So that was, um, you know, that things were going good until then. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about your mom in, in a moment here. Just one, one more thing on, on you being stuck in the moment, in now. Mm -hmm. um, Let's talk about the paradox of time. Well, what what is that paradox? I mean, I I'm not smart enough to to try and to try and um to try and dissect this. I I do try and dissect it. Um, I've, I've wrote about it. I I've wrote in my second book about it, and and I'm writing about it again in my third book. Kind of like obsessed about it. Um, but it is it is nuts. You know, as as far as I understand it, science has got, and somebody might correct me here, but 
um, that there's two sort of mainstream scientific ways of looking at it. And one is, is that the, there is a timeline. There's a, there's a beginning and, the, and there's this sort of nondescript future um, that we've got. And, or then there is truly only the moment of now, which opens up all sorts of possibilities, possibly meaning that everything that could ever happen is happening right now. Um, which means, you know, multiple timelines, <laughs> what's the word, the, the multiverse, various, you know, like every single possibility. And, and I think that's what people talk about when they're talking like lately around the sort of spiritual communities. I think this idea of shifting timelines is sort of essentially based around that, that we have only got now. And if that's the truth and, and everything is possible, you know, there's a version of you that is doing this, there's a version of you that's doing that. And you just need to tap into that timeline which is happening right now. It's, it, it's a lot. <laughs> well, it, you know, especially when we're stuck in this uh, 3D world uh, where we, you can't, we seemingly can't escape a timeline. I'm a, mm. I'm a art and student of the modern spiritual guide, A Course in Miracles. And it's distinctly states that there is no past. There's no future. There's only the holy instant, only in the moment, only now. And, yeah. So I think that, you know, many people like you and myself and millions upon the people upon the world are discovering this. And, and I think the work you're doing is beautiful in that it is helping people to open up so they don't have to think they're going crazy. Mm. Well, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, that I, 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 I have had like uh, one or two people email me and, and I've done a couple of uh, talks over here workshops and stuff and and yeah people have a, a, have approached and said okay I, I had something similar that thought i was going absolutely insane you know and um yeah it, it seems to be i'm not sure about common but it, it seems to happen yeah yeah well let's talk um more about your your mother i mean she is a central figure in in your life uh, he loved her dearly, as, as most of us do with our, our mothers. And, and I mean, especially in her later years uh, until uh, she passed, uh, that was a big part of your awakening, right? I mean, that was the, the catalyst for the book. Um, I, I would say it was her passing was, and, and what happened around her passing was the, was the spur to, yeah, all of this. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have wrote the book if she's still here. Um, so that was kind of where the, somewhat where the title came from, a play on words. Uh, so I'm just looking at it right now, um, you know, letting go, let, letting go. But there was something that came out of it, this sort of dive, uh, deep dive into spiritual um, teachings and, you know, sort of come away with it with a lot, which I wouldn't have done if my mom was still here. I, I At least I don't believe I would have done. Um, yeah, you know, um, so my mom, my mom had a, a very difficult life. Um, and then for the last 20 years, she lived, she lived alone on the Isle of Wight where I grew up um she would you know come to finland and visit and stuff like that and we would occasionally go on holiday together but yeah 2020 came along um and i'm about three hours away from the isle of Wight, just sort of talk practically um and then it's a short boat trip um but i would go and see her um pretty frequently like pretty much like every week every two weeks something like that since i moved back to the uk um in 2017 but yeah of course then we went through the pandemic and we had various government restrictions and lockdowns and all the rest of it. And I thought I was doing the right thing by, you know, adhering to that. And I, I didn't want to, you know, give a COVID essentially. So, you know, I, I kept away for the most part of that year. And she grew increasingly lonely and she deteriorated in health quite a lot. You know, she had high blood pressure, various related, uh, various age related health problems, uh, like a, a heart problem. Um, but she'd always bounce back from these things. And um, anyway, we went through 2020 uh skipped christmas which which we were supposed to spend together but blah 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 more government stuff um and, and we didn't do it um and then january 2021 um i on this particular night i facetime called her and, and we would do this pretty much every day a couple of times a day and we were in another lockdown again although at this point people weren't taking it that seriously i think everyone was kind of tired of it um so I think it was the third call that day and it was around this time of night, like in, in the UK, close to 10 o'clock. Um, and she picked the phone up and just sort of talk about it again, sort of in, in a practical way. She had her phone charging on the floor and as she sort of hit 
you know, as I saw her um, appear on the screen and she and she her face sort of took up half of the screen. There was a man leaning in from the other side and I saw him long enough that I could describe him. He had thinning gray hair, glasses, probably looked like he was mid 60s, something like that, um, kind of very gaunt looking. And I was kind of taken aback, right? You know, we were in lockdown. I knew her whole circle. Um, it was quite late at night. And again, the Isle of Wight is a very rural place. I, you know, there's nothing, there's no one around. We didn't have any other family there. And I was like, well, who the hell is that? You know, and as she sort of moved away, the guy went out of shot. And I said, who's that? And she said, who's what? And I was like, okay, well, I, I just saw this guy like long enough, you know, that it wasn't just like a, a flash or a glitch or whatever it could have been. And she said, no, 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 there's no one here, you know. Um, and I said, Mom, I said, sorry, I said, sorry, but I just saw someone. I was like, who's the guy? And she said, yeah, no, there's there's nobody here. And and she went and sort of sat down on the sofa and I must have grilled her a little bit on it. Um, she was saying, well, there's not been anyone here since lunchtime. Um, she had these um, sort of like help, uh, nurses that would come by and make sure she took her meds properly and stuff like that. And and I, and I, I, I assumed it was one of them, but I'd never seen them there past 6 p.m., like over you know, over nearly a year, a year of this. Um, and she just, yeah, just dismissed it. And I could always tell if somebody was with her because her whole demeanor would change, you know, she would speak a lot more eloquently. Um, you know, she wouldn't be herself and it would be really frustrating to, to try and have a conversation with her. And she wasn't doing anything like that. So I thought, all right, well, I guess I was mistaken, even though I'd seen this guy. And we talked for another 45 minutes or so. I said, good night. And then, the next morning I woke up to a phone call from a neighbor that they couldn't get in. And when they did, my mom was, you know, at the tail end of a heart attack and, and passed away sort of right there and then. And of course, you know, this thing wasn't, you know, that this sort of possible paranormal encounter wasn't um, my main concern. I, I went through the whole, you know, I just lost my mom, um, but it did stick at the back of my mind. Um, and, and and I kind of didn't really know what to do with it. Because it wasn't, I, I was thinking, okay, what are we talking? Are we talking spirit guys here? We're we talking ghosts, which again, wasn't something that I was into at the time. Um, but that seemed to be the logical explanation. You know, I mean, of course I wasn't with her. So I couldn't 100% say that there was absolutely nobody there. But just knowing everything I did, knowing her, da her daily routines, knowing everybody around there, I don't believe that anyone was physically with her, you know. Um, but on the other end of it, I didn't recognize him. So it wasn't like, oh, that was like Uncle Tony or something, you know, it wasn't like a comfort, you know, that, oh, okay, well, he came to collect her. Mm. And it was just kind of this mystery, but it did just sort of play at the back of my mind. And, and, I, and I started telling people about it and people would say, well, you know, you're grieving. And I'd be like, well, no, it wasn't grief because it was before the fact, you know, it, this happened before my mom passed away. Um. And then, of course, the other side of, of the conversation were people saying, well, yeah, that was obviously a sign, you know, that was somebody letting you know that she was about to pass. So I, I kind of I kind of went with that one and um and started sort of diving deep into into spirituality. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a very long, <laughs> long winded. Uh, well, I, I want to thank you because I, I know that's very emotional for you to talk about. I'm sure when you were writing about it, you probably had tears falling down on your keyboard because I know how uh, you really make it very clear how much you loved your mother. And, and that's that's so beautiful. And, and it, it is interesting, though, um, you know, the pandemic was a rough time for all 8 billion people on the planet. And, and so there were many people that deteriorated at, at that time. But, you know, just one more thing on your mother. Um, I did read, I loved uh, the experience you had in a church where there was a medium there. I think it was in a church. There was a medium there. And uh, she described uh, your mom being right there. And, and I didn't know if you can talk about that experience. That was pretty nice. Yeah, well, that that was kind of the next thing that was really in the next catalyst. Um, I, I'd started working on a movie. Um, not that this really has much to do with it, but um, I, I, it was a good. There hadn't been any work, you know, for such a long time, and I had a good four months on this on this movie. I wasn't doing much on there. I was just one of many of these uh, warriors or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and um and I kind of like started looking at books that I'd read in my youth and and I and I I went with Neil Donald Walsh you know I kind of went back to the some of the sort of more obvious ones um and because I didn't really know much about this stuff to be honest with you at the time 
And then I read a book by a medium called Claire Broad, um, which really resonated with me. And um, and an interesting, funny little story around that as well was that I, I just actually I didn't read it. Sorry, I listened to it. It was an audio book. Um, but yeah, the 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 book. To, I didn't know who Claire was. She could have been from Australia, America, or or the UK. I didn't do any research on her. And the book opened up. Her first story took place in a cemetery across the street from where I lived, which was oh, nuts wow. in London. Right. I could look out of the window and see this actual cemetery. And I was like, well, what are the chances of that? But anyway, point being, I, I had a lot of time on this movie to just sit around, listen to and read books. Um, and, and that four months of kind of devouring all that stuff, I was kind of ready to dive into the paranormal, you know. Um, and around the same time, I walked past uh, a spiritualist church, uh, which we have many of over here. Um, but I, I didn't really know what a spiritualist church was, but it, it had a, a board outside that said what was going on. And every Sunday there was a demonstration of mediumship, which, you know, which I knew was what was by that, that point. So I thought, all right, I'll go along to this. Um, and I sort of went very with a very skeptical attitude, although I was hoping to hear from my mom. And this is probably a couple of months later, probably a couple, two or three months after she passed. Um, so I wandered into this place and there was a lady up there and she was just sort of, you know, just talking to people like going to this lady over here, going to that person there and, giving them little bits of information, but she was getting like, yes, after yes, you know, people were like, yeah, yeah, makes perfect sense, you know, and I was thinking, okay, maybe there's something to this, you know, um, she was getting like a 90% success rate of, of people, you know, aff affirming everything that she was coming out with. And then she came to me um, and she started talking about a young man. And I was like, well, I have no idea who she's talking about, you know, and she kept describing this guy and I was sitting there thinking, well, I'm not really interested. I want to hear from my mom, you know. I didn't say this. I was just kind of giving her yeses and nos and, and not leading her or anything. Um, and she kept insisting about this guy and and talking about we went to college together and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, the, the penny dropped, you know. And I was like, oh, she's talking about this friend of mine that, that passed when he was around 20. I, I hadn't thought about him in years, you know. And as soon as I realized it was him, everything she said fell into place, you know. And I, And I was just kind of blown away. She started talking about me being a medium, um, which I which I wasn't, you know, thinking of doing at the time. And then she kind of wrapped it up by saying, Oh, I've I've got a lady here that recently passed. And um, you know, lump went straight to my throat. And uh, she described my mom physically and then just briefly described the circumstances around her passing. Um, and said this lovely thing about angels lifting her up and and uh that it was that it was wonderful. And the game changer was her accent changed uh -huh. so this medium she had a very strong london accent like a cockney accent um and then on, and then halfway through talking she started speaking in like my mum's accent who had a kind of northern english accent and that was like it was my mum's words coming out of it you know and that and that was really like okay this this seems legit you know and 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 that pretty much changed everything i have to say the the reading from that lady wow what an experience that, that is amazing and so that me particular medium that wasn't Claire. It was a different lady. Oh, yeah, this is a lady called Janet Neville. Um, yeah, she uh, she she has wrote a couple of books as well, actually. Um, but yeah, yeah, very nice lady. She's kind of local to the area of London where I am, and um, yeah, I got I got to say she really contributed to opening up this whole new world to me. Yeah. Well, I would like to discuss this. Um, you you also write about in practices what what exactly or who exactly are spirit guides what what's their job and who are they well um i feel that i'm still at the start of my journey um i i guess it's pretty much coming up to the three year mark around my mom passing which is pretty much the same amount of time as i've been like actively pursuing this stuff um i seem to move along very quickly in the first year second year when the book came out I kind of got distracted with all the stuff around the book. Um, so didn't really sort of practice as much as I should, but I did sit in a, in a development circle um, with, you know, established mediums and the, the way that we would work is, or they call it work um, is that we would sort of open ourselves up, open up the chakras, open up the, uh, our energy and invite our guides to come in who are supposedly sort of intermediaries like mediums between the mediums essentially um the the way that i've understood it the that then bring in those people uh that may have passed over if you're sitting with 
somebody that's lost someone you know um so the the, the spirit guide will be the will be the one that sort of forms an orderly cue you know of, of of anyone that wants to come through but yeah i mean as as far as i've been writing and, and learning um they're they're essentially with us all the time uh just to go way out there um it's kind of funny talking about these things because i don't really talk about i haven't talked about these things for a while um the the you know, that we possibly knew them before we came into this life you know that we've made agreements with them and they're keeping an eye on us through through all that we do and you know we just need to call on them uh when we need some assistance which they do anyway um but they don't necessarily interfere you know um i, I feel that meditation is the key to to getting in touch if, if you somebody would want to get in touch with a spirit guide at least that's the way that i've i've done it and i've had a couple of again in the book um i don't know if you got to that part but i i had a couple of um sort of strong indicators that 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 they're around yeah yeah well uh, i can tell you my particular spirit guides uh, or guardian angels they put in a lot of overtime i think they all have gray hair from <laughs> from saving my butt multiple times throughout my lifetime and uh, that's probably true of most spirit guides um interesting interesting so so now you have transitioned uh you're you're a, a are you a full-time working medium are you still doing movies or both yeah no no far from it um i i feel like i've got a long way to go it, it's an interesting one because there's such a there's such a history of spiritualism here as there is in the states as well um but yeah here at least is the, there's a very sort of traditional way of doing things or there has been um and i i feel like a little bit of a maverick sort of stepping in writing a book within my first year of leaning about the, learning about these things and telling everyone else how to do it, you know, um, or saying what worked for me at least. So I don't think it's the sort of traditional way. So I'm being sort of very somewhat cautious about stepping on anyone's toes. I know a lot of established mediums, you know, didn't even do a, an actual reading for the first seven years of, of learning about it or something like that. Um, on the other hand, I've had some mediums talk to me and say, well, you have wrote a book and and you have opened this you know the, this sort of door and you are hopefully helping people in, in this direction so who's to say what's the the right approach anymore you know but i'm just trying to be sort of mindful and and i'm not calling myself a, a medium um, i've definitely got a lot to learn and i i feel that i've you know i've gone through even in these three short years i feel like i've i've gone through sort of ebbs and flows with it you know mm. um i feel like lately it, it's kind of it's all coming back but there was definitely a strong period uh, through the last year where I kind of wasn't really, really getting anything. So yeah, it, it's an interesting process. I'm just sort of documenting the journey uh, as I go. Well, I admire you for taking the the, the step and doing that. You know, it takes a uh, it takes a, a lot of um, overcoming fears and doubts. You know, especially when we're so entrained into the three D world, and now you've opened up and realized there is much beyond what we actually see. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a, a little sticker on the back window of my car that says, dare, dream, risk. So you know what, you've done that your whole life. I mean, you know, if you don't, if you have a purpose and a goal, why not? Why not move forward rather than stay in that little cubby hole where you could be until you die and who wants to do that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, personally, I never really knew what I wanted to do, like career-wise, that was never, that was really never a thing. I remember being obsessed with movies as a, kid and and like as i sort of hit 40 something i thought well i'll try and look into that and it's been all right it's paid the bills but it's not i'm not under any illusions about it um and then again i i still don't feel like that that was even kind of my thing writing this book and opening up to these things i feel that I, i've found what i what i was always supposed to do um, i'm definitely not getting rich from any of it you know but it, it feels like it feels right finally you know after doing like this and that and not really getting any satisfaction out of conventional jobs you know yeah you're not rich yet but you know i saw a most interesting uh quote from uh spiritual teacher jennifer hadley she said um i my whole life changed when i decided to to work and live from love and not trying to make money and once she did that mm -hmm. then the money started to flow in because she wasn't so focused on it so still waiting for that <laughs> but yeah no i know so in, in all seriousness yeah i i, I agree um yeah i you know I, i've never money's never really been a motivating factor for me of course we need it um 
yeah, of course I'm sort of tired of having moments of struggle, but yeah, this does feel like I'm I'm sort of finally do, like without sounding too grandiose. I feel like I was always meant to do this. And then also, you know, with the experiences I've had over the last couple of years, it kind of re made me reevaluate those other things that had happened over the years. And it would seem that every five or six years, something would be tapping me on the shoulder, you know, with the possible psychotic break or, or with the astral projection or with all these other things, they would just seem to come up every now and again. And it didn't seem like it was happening to anyone else, you know. And then like, here we are, and it's, it all kind of makes sense now. I bet you've had some interesting changes in your fr uh, relationships with friends. They're probably going, you're doing what now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of funny. Like, I mean, I've got some of my older friends. I was talking to somebody today about it, just about this subject. And, and I got one like very good friend who doesn't know how to talk to me about this stuff. You know, we're best friends, but he's like, I don't want to talk about it. He's like, it's, it's just too, it just weirds him out. And there was a weird little unrest period between us for a few months when he sort of saw me going in this direction and I was like it's fine you know we're still um, we've still got the same relationship you know it's just uh I'm just going in this direction now you know um yeah it's you know I get it and I, I would have been and I still am skeptical about this you know I don't just kind of just buy into everything that somebody says because I do believe in these things I'll still kind of give it a healthy judgment <laughs> yeah and my, myself included you know well, I think as you pursue this, you're going to make uh, connections in, in new uh, colleagues and friends around the world. You know, most of my personal friends, I can't talk to them about this stuff. I go, hey, did you see the football game last night? You know, which I like, you know, uh, but, you know, hey, did you uh, what did spirit say to you last night? They just glaze over, you know, but right. you know, I allow them to be that way, you know, and but uh, as you network and continue doing this, I have colleagues around the world mm -hmm. and friends who I can talk to in the moment's notice, just like this. And, yeah. and now we have a forum of podcasts where we can actually speak to the entire world about it. And the world is more open than it ever has about this information, which is why I have this podcast. Uh, we're talking about Phil Webster from the UK and a, an actor, a, a budding medium, an author, best-selling author. And speaking of that, uh, tell us about your sequel. It's called Glowing Deeper, uh, the new book that's just about to come out. Yeah, thanks. Um, so essentially, when I, I finish um, Letting Glow by the end of it, I, felt, I keep, and again, sorry, I keep looking over here because it's, it's there. <laughs> and then the other one just happens to be there as well. So there's the there's the next one that's on its way. Um, it, like when I finished the first one, I felt like I'd learned so much by the end of it that I, that I looked back on it and, and I felt like oh, I've progressed so, you know, so far with this already, you know, that I'd had all these amazing experiences that I wrote about in the book and they kept happening and, and I just wanted to keep going. So um, I, I just sort of opened up and continued writing. Um, but the second book is kind of less about me and just sort of more about these amazing things that I learned about, you know. Um, I, I, I learned from some amazing people. Um, I, I spoke with shamans and many mediums, um, and, and, and learned a, a lot about sort of different cultures. Um, and, and I sort of thought, well, what would I like to read around this stuff? It was just more really about everything that interested me that I hope would be interesting, hope would be interesting to other people. Like I've read about uh, like a brief history of witchcraft, uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. got into the whole time as metaphysics and and um yeah sort of just sort of covered everything and then eventually it does come back to developing as a medium and it includes lots of meditations as, as does the first book to sort of progress you in, in that or, or at least like i say what worked for me you know um yeah i suppose the difference in that book is that my personal experiences i've only wrote about what i know you know i can't sort of any sort of ghost stories or anything like that i'm not telling anybody else's i'll just tell what's happened to me um, but it takes a little bit of a different turn when I sort of talk about, um, more, like I say, more traditional historical events and things like that. Well, I'm going to look forward to uh, reading that new book, Glowing Deeper by Phil Webster, Phil with two L's on it. Uh, so uh, very, very interesting stuff. Um, Phil, now you you uh, have a website. Are you doing one-on-one -on -one sessions and events with groups? I think you have uh, meditations you have on there too, right? Yeah, I've started putting a few meditations out on YouTube, just little five-minute meditations. I don't have the best uh, recording equipment, but I'm sort of finding my way with it. Um, it has some positive feedback. It's very, it is very early days. I'm not really a, a YouTuber or anything like that. 
my website yeah is uh philwebster.com um and then i'm most active on instagram uh, what i would like to do in the coming months is maybe set up uh, an online circle where people can get together and we can progress together you know um again not calling myself a medium it will definitely go in that direction um but yeah get together maybe once every couple of weeks sit in meditation uh talk about things like we've talked about and and just sort of see where it goes and like i say hopefully progress as modern mystics yeah <laughs> so if, if somebody wants to connect with you uh, uh just go to your website and you have a contact yeah, yeah definitely i think just scroll down to the bottom of the home page uh, uh philwebster.com and and uh yeah everything's there Excellent. And uh, anybody would like to grab a copy of Phil's book, uh, I will have the links in the show notes. Also, a listing of his website. You can check that out. And Phil, I honor you. I, I really honor you because I, I love how you have grabbed a hold of your your new abilities and, and stepped forward to, I'm, believe me, you're making a positive, lovely, beautiful difference in the world, in people's lives. Thank you very much. And you too, doing, doing what you do. I, I, I very much appreciate it. This has been another episode of World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with host Carl Gruber, a certified law of attraction life coach. We welcome you to tune in to each and every episode of World Awakenings as we open your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to the truth of all things spiritual, metaphysical, and enlightening, and just how much they play an all-important role in our moment-to-moment -moment daily life. Much love and light to you, my friend, and thank you for tuning into World Awakenings. Mm -hmm.